Hello there, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly, a podcast for and by entrepreneurs, successful business people, and those of us who deal with not only the ups and downs of business, but the pain, frustration, and all the good things that come along with chronic illness. Today, we're actually going to be talking to Mark Mawinney, who's a lifelong entrepreneur who helps coaches get more clients without paid advertising. He achieves this with his coaching program, his podcast, Natural Born Coaches, his Facebook group, The Coaching Jungle, and his exclusive hard copy newsletter, Secret Coach Club. He's been a speaker at events like Social Media Marketing World, frequently makes media appearances, and has contributed to publications like Entrepreneur.com. You can learn more about Mark at www.mark.coach, and that's Mark with a C. Welcome today, Mark. It's so nice to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nancy. Um, I have been in your group, The Coaching Jungle, for geez, over a year now, I think. And there's always wonderful, wonderful people in their great conversations. In fact, I'm jealous. I want to get my group to, to when it grows up to be like yours, because okay. I think it's just such a great group. But um, a lot of the people that are in there are, it seems to me, people who already have thriving businesses is that is that pretty accurate assumption um actually no i think there's a mix uh so a good example is we ask a few questions when people uh, request to join the group and one of those questions is what's your biggest challenge in your coaching business and you'd be surprised how many coaches out there are struggling with leads um getting more business revenue it's usually related to the the money side of it Although there's some that say time management or scaling or whatever, but for the most part, um, that's what people are looking for. So I, it's a really um, broad range of people in there. There are a lot of established coaches, like you said, but there are a lot that are just getting started. They're in their first few years and getting traction. They're trying to get traction and they're across the board, all sorts of niches and um, all around the world. So it's a really, um, it's really a melting pot. It's really interesting, and, and I love, uh, you know, I can't go a day without jumping on to, to your group and reading what some of the new posts are, but talking mm. about the financials, because I know that that's really one of the biggest issues. We all, I think, for the most part, start our businesses because we want to have freedom, we want to have more money, we want to be able to do things that we want to do but we don't really stop to think about how we're going to get the money in. We're doing something that we're passionate about. We think, oh, everybody's going to want what I have to offer. But then when we jump into the business, we find out that, oh, wait a minute, this takes money. Mm. How do you tell people, what do you tell people when they're trying to start out and grow their business and they have a very, very limited budget? Well, I've been there. So a good example with my own business, I started coaching in 2014. Uh, before that, I'd done real estate for about 10 years and I built a successful real estate business. I had a lot of employees, a couple of offices and things were going great until everything collapsed. Uh, so I had a couple of years there where I was going through the wilderness and um, I was helped back to my feet by coaches, which is how I got into coaching. But when I started my coaching business in 2014, I didn't have access to the capital that I once had in my real estate days, which was very frustrating because I thought, oh man, I wish I had, you know, 20 or $50,000 I could put into ads and it just would make things go, go much easier. Uh, what I've discovered now with the benefit of hindsight and playing Monday morning quarterback is it was actually a positive to be starting on a shoestring budget because it forced me to roll up my sleeves and uh, put the work in and, and really do um, organic things. It didn't cost money to get my message out there. 
but it allowed me to really hone my message and to get confident with what I was saying. So I find that a lot of coaches getting started, if they're sitting on a pile of cash, let's say they're coming from corporate or they have uh, maybe uh, some sort of, um, you know, package, uh, severance package or something that they're, they're living off, they, they're trying to shortcut the process by throwing thousands and thousands of dollars into uh, ads and fancy funnels and stuff, but then they're not getting that the benefit of having to actually put their message out there and, and work through it. So I would suggest anyone listening to this, who's um, starting on a shoestring budget to flip it around in your mind and turn it into a positive rather than a negative. So you, you do have to play a Jedi mind trick on yourself a bit, <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, there's a silver lining in that cloud. When do you think it becomes important for you know because like you said when you start out if you if you have a, a shoestring budget you're doing everything yourself there comes a time though i think for most of us when especially for someone like my viewers who have chronic illnesses and can't really do things because they don't have the energy there comes a time when they need to figure out how they're going to bring somebody else in, how they're going to do something that doesn't require them to mm. do it. You know what I mean? Um, thoughts on that. When when do you think it's it's good to let go of a little bit of that doing it all yourself? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I know the popular thought is that you should delegate everything. You see the gurus out there that are, and I've seen, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I've seen posts like, if you're tying your own shoes, that's seven seconds that could be spent on building your business. Why the heck are you tying your own shoes? You know, I mentioned once that I like mowing my lawn. I actually find it relaxing. I could listen to a podcast, listen to an audio book. I enjoy getting the fresh air and getting out on the lawnmower. And uh, someone said to me, oh my God, you mow your own lawn? Why don't you hire someone for that? And that's just that mentality with it. So. I think it's good to delegate, don't get me wrong, but in the early stages, you are having to play what could be called chief cook and bottle washer, where you're doing everything. And I think the key is to um, hand off those things that you don't enjoy doing uh, or you're not very good at as soon as possible. And you don't have to have hand off everything all at once because that's what a lot of people are thinking. Oh, I got to do the, to get to the four hour work week, hand off everything. You could start small. So, for example, with my business, in a year after or almost a year after my podcast since it had launched i basically talked my twin brother matt into starting a podcast editing business um i twisted his arm because he was looking to make a change with in his life and he's looking to start a business i said why don't you start a podcast editing business i hate editing my show i know a bunch of people that do i could throw you clients so he took over at he and his team editing my show in 2015 and that was great because i don't enjoy editing and then I started to look for other ways that I could delegate. You know, I have a number of people helping to manage the coaching jungle, my Facebook group. There's almost 20 volunteer admin that are inside there now that are helping out with that. So there's an example where you don't even always have to pay because we work out, I work out a few perks for them, like promotional perks and things, but I'm not paying out for the team in the Facebook group. Uh, with it. So you just have to get a little bit creative. Maybe you could barter if there's something that you're good at. If you need help with something, maybe there, um, usually I'm not a fan of bartering, but I think in that situation that could work out well uh, too. So yeah, um, it, yeah you got to, um, I guess uh, it, it, there's a little bit of using your gut when it's the right time to hand something off, but don't cling on to everything just because you think you have to do it. I, I, th I think that's a, an excellent thought and an excellent comment for you know i've been doing this for a long time and about two years ago, back when i had my brick and mortar i had 10 employees but it was an entirely different situation there it was doing different things it was you know and and when i started doing my online business it's got to do it all myself and because of that i've learned all of these different tools and strategies that I can then turn around and share with other people. But about three years ago now, I said, I just can't do all of it myself. I need to have some help. And I brought on my assistant who now does most of all the back office work for me, which frees me up to have these conversations, to, you know, do 
the training programs that I do and, and actually be present to talk with my clients and do things and not have to worry about is my podcast going to get posted on time and in the places it needs to be. And I also probably about six months ago decided it was time for me to have somebody else write my social media posts and things because I wasn't getting anywhere with it and I hated doing it. And so, you know, I brought her on and, and, but you do it a little bit at a time, I think. And, and as you said, you do, you bring in people that do things that you are either not any good at or that you don't like doing, you know, and, and that frees you up. But I still think you need to, maintain some of most of the control and do the things that you can do yourself. Yeah. The uh, challenge, even for someone who's not suffering from a chronic, um, you know, disease or illness is uh, I struggle with this is workaholism. So I want to, if I, if I let myself, I could work 24 <laughs> seven or close to, I have to force myself to shut down at yeah. night and I'm getting better at it. It's been a work in progress the last few years, but I have gotten better at uh, not being attached to my laptop or to my iPhone all the time uh, because there's always more work that you could be doing. And you really have to remember that it's, it's a uh, marathon, not a sprint. So that's a challenge for entrepreneurs. Most people have to motivate themselves to get off the couch and go do work. Entrepreneurs, we have to force ourselves away from work to go on the couch and relax for a little bit and not have the laptop up while you're watching Netflix and trying to multitask. Oh, that sounds so like me. <laughs> That's exactly like me. I, I have a very tough time because I would want to get the laptop open. And I think, okay, well, I could do both at the same time. And that's not very refreshing when you're trying to relax. Uh, no, and it, you screw up things when you're trying to work. You know, what did they say? And you jump and you look at the TV and you, oh, shoot, I just sent that email and I didn't mean to. <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. So it doesn't do good in either way when you're trying to multitask. Uh, or if or you're, like yeah. And if you have an online business, coaching business or whatever, and if you're working 120 hours a week, you're probably doing something wrong there. So I'm not, I'm not a four hour work week guy. I would go crazy if I was working just four hours a week. That being said, I don't want to be like Gary Vaynerchuk or Grant Cardone who shame people if they're not working while they're in the shower, you know, on yeah. the phone or type in an email while they're getting a the shower, then yeah. they're suddenly, they don't want it bad enough. Um, I lean towards that hustle mentality, but I don't want to be working every single waking hour either. Yeah. So Yeah. I try to shut down. Usually I'm up five o'clock in the morning and I'm usually computer on my lap by six, mm. six 30. And I usually shut down and my husband gets so mad at me. I shut down about eight o'clock at night and I go to bed where I work on my phone for another three hours, mm. <laughs> but at least I don't have the computer. It's, it's being done on my phone. So <laughs> yeah, well, I've been tracking screen time with my iPhone because there's a setting. If you go in the, the general settings that you could see your screen time and I'd started a few months back and I did really good one week with the screen time, but then my Mac book was also tracking screen time and it went up. Basically I replaced the time I saved on the iPhone. I was just working more on the laptop uh, with it. So now I'm tracking both of them and uh, I'll never be uh, one of these people that can not look at their phone for a week or even a day. Like I, I, for me, it's more stressful not knowing what's going on. So I do like to check in, but I'm getting away from that habit of I'm an early riser as well. You know, I'm usually up by five 30 and I would look at my phone first thing, you know, let's see what's going on. Make sure the world didn't blow up or a zombie apocalypse or something. Um, that's a bad habit to get into too. It's just starting your day dealing with other people's issues normally. Normally, uh, yeah. if there's something going on with it. So what I'm looking at doing, and it sounds funny for anyone who doesn't have an online business because they think, so what, Mark? But I'm doing a 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. digital detox for those 12 hours. So by 9 p.m., that means I can have a few hours to quiet my brain before bed. Um, and then in the morning, I have a couple hours before looking at it. Now, anyone else hearing that would be like, so what? 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. That's simple. That's For most people, they're not doing that's not a big deal for them. But for anyone in the online space, I'm guessing a lot of people would find that very difficult to have 12 hours that they're not 
attach the technology. I would go nuts. I would totally yeah. go nuts. I would just, I, I couldn't do it. And I, I'm happy to, I, yeah, I wake up in the middle of the night and pull my, my phone and go, mm -hmm. all right, what's happened in the last two hours? Cause I haven't had my phone in two hours. Well, I'll share something that could relieve any guilt for anyone listening to this is uh, you're actually probably shooting yourself in the foot. If let's say, for example, you check your email and your Facebook messages constantly to get back to people because it's giving the appearance that you're not very busy. Yeah. Uh, if somebody gets back to you within a minute or so, you think, oh, wow, what are they sitting on their email or on their Facebook message? So you have to um, pull back a little bit and, and let people miss you. Um, not to get political or anything. I'm in Canada, so I'm not in, I don't have a dog in the fight, I guess, for your politics, but Hillary Clinton's a good example. Um, in 2016, when she lost, I think she probably should have stepped back and let people miss her for a little bit. But she has a book out right away, talk, blaming people for what happened, why she lost. And then she's sniping at different candidates and she's inserting herself all the time. And she's not really giving any breathing room to become an a elder stateswoman in the Democratic Party because she's not letting them miss her. Like that, it, I, the Clintons have been involved in public life probably for what the last 50 years or 40 yeah. some years with no break whatsoever. Yeah. And that's a little too much. And, and same thing with the coaching world is if you're always there and you're, you're always available, you're not really helping in a lot of ways it's hurting. So I share that just, it doesn't hurt to wait a while to answer people don't wait a week, but um, I always answer clients within a day, you know, that, that day, but I don't answer within two, two minutes. Yeah. Uh, the absolutely. other thing to do, yeah, and the other uh, tip I would give is with your online calendar, even if you don't have any appointments booked, don't have all open space. Sometimes I'll go into an online calendar and it's like every waking hour they have an opening. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, this person isn't very busy. If I was a potential client, that wouldn't look great. So you should probably block off time anyways for personal development, for reading, for doing different things, uh, content creation or other stuff you're working on, but don't have every single waking hour open in your calendar. It doesn't look great. Yeah. Excellent, excellent suggestions. And, and I do that as well on my calendar. It's just I have certain times and certain days that you can reach me, and the rest of the time it's closed off. And I get, well, but I can't do it because you don't have – Oh, well, you know, those are the times I have your available. Your business, your, your rules, yeah. So sorry yeah. to get political. Next, we're going to talk about impeachment. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, please. I'm so tired of it. <laughs> you're in a battleground state, so you're, you're going to be really stressed out in 2020. <laughs> you betcha. And I'm just, I'm just tired of the whole nonsense. <laughs> All right, back to <laughs> what we're talking about let's we, we were we started out talking about money and talking about starting a business on a budget in order to grow that budget you need to be making money and i don't know about men because i've not really ever asked this of men i have thoughts but for many many women it is very difficult for us to decide what we're going to charge for our products or our services because of various reasons you know some of us don't think we're worth a lot of money there's you know but i'd rather get a little than nothing there's all kinds of mental things that go on with figuring out what we want to charge for our services thoughts tell us what you think about that well, I don't think men are immune to that either. So, uh, I mean, I, I've kind of had a lot of male clients that have that same, those same money blocks and same issues. Uh, by the way, I'll recommend a book if anyone who has a, um, a block around this, it's called Money, or sorry, Dollars Flow to Me Easily by Richard Dots, D-O-T-T-S. And that's great for helping with any blocks around money. Um, I had a client yesterday who was telling uh, me, he was actually he's in my mastermind group and uh, he's had a really good month, awesome month. And uh, he's having trouble because he's not, he's used to the roller coaster uh, with his business. And he said, I'm really uncomfortable because it's been almost too easy <laughs> this month, you know, with all the money that's coming in, I'm not used to it. And I'm feeling like I might sabotage myself 
unconsciously sub sabotage himself with it. So I think men and women definitely struggle with it. I've always said the toughest person to convince about paying your coaching fees isn't anyone out there. It's the person in the mirror, the man or a woman in the mirror. Once you can convince yourself that it's worth it, the rest is much easier. But that, that's a trick is how do you convince yourself? Uh, I'll tell a really quick story of a client, a, a coach that I know uh, doubled his fees to something that he really wasn't comfortable with. And it was like the highest amount he'd ever charged, doubled or tripled or something a lot more than he'd previously charged. And on his first call with a prospect with those new fees, when the prospect asked him, how can I work with you? You know, how much is your package or whatever? The coach gave the total. And now this wasn't a video call, by the way, this would look weird if it was a video call. He literally had to shove his fist in his mouth to keep himself from then qualifying it. Because if not, he was afraid he would have said, well, this is my this is my fee, but this is what you get, and I might have some flexibility, and blah, 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 or whatever. So he put his fist in his mouth to keep himself from talking, shooting himself mm -hmm. in the foot. He said it was the longest 10 seconds in his life. The guy got then said, okay, great, how do I pay you? <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> There's a tip. Put your fist in your mouth if it's not a video call. I just did that this morning. I was talking to somebody just typing, you know, we were on Facebook and we were talking back and forth and they wanted to know what my new program costs. And I'm going, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and I had to basically sit on my hand. So I didn't, didn't type all this stuff. Well, I had a call last week. Yeah. The, the uh, person asked me last week, he said, where are the guarantees, um, Mark, with your program? I said, there's no guarantees. I said, only guarantees in life are death and taxes. Because uh, I said, for all I know, you could lay on the couch all day, never open up your laptop and just drinking beer and watching sports all day, you know, Homer Simpson uh, mm -hmm. or something. He kind of laughed, but I was just being honest. I said, I can't. Um, a lot of the coaches that offer guarantees have small print that they never will have to honor those guarantees or anything like that. If you look at the small print, I'm just very upfront. Now, a lot of coaches would be, would be um, hesitant to be that candid. With someone, they would say, well, you know, and they try to qualify it or whatever. Me, I'm just like, no, there's no guarantees. You got to put the work in for this this to get the results uh, yeah. with it. So it's all about not um, putting the prospect on a pedestal. You know, you're maintaining your power with it, and you're not displaying any neediness. Um, so, I mean, a good example, Nancy, and this isn't anything that you did wrong because this is how you run your show. But when we booked this podcast and, and you invited me on the show, I'm like, that's great. I'd love to go on. And I know that you usually uh, book a pre-chat, uh, like a separate call, and then you do the interview, whatever, a few weeks after that. And I was just very upfront. I said, I, I can't do that, Nancy. I don't do pre-chats, just I don't have the bandwidth for it. And you were very good. You said, okay, no, that's great. We'll chat the same day before we hit record on it. And But you didn't have to do that. If you came back to me and you said, Mark, um, sorry, it's not going to work. I'd be like, okay, that's your show and your rules, right? Yeah. Like, that's your yeah. choice. But um that's just a it's good to have some rules in place principles things that you follow if not you'll drive yourself crazy in the online space absolutely and just to let you know for most people i'd say you don't want to talk to me if in you know first that's fine but thank you no thank you i wanted you on the show so you know. well we're on video now i can see in the background there's a dart board with a picture of mark and there's a whole bunch of darts on him there so <laughs> you were, i know you were upset no um it's all it's all about just being kind of um very just honest which it sounds funny to say this but in the online space most people aren't honest mm -hmm. there's so much bs uh, there's so much people not saying what they really think they don't want to offend people or they're trying to make a sale or whatever um, for this I've taken the approach with my business there's a movie from like, I'm not gonna get political here but from the 1990s called Bullworth you ever see that one with Warren Beatty mm -hmm. yeah, so anyone who hasn't seen it Warren Beatty is a politician running for the re-election to the California Senate in um, uh, back in the 90s and it's his final election he's depressed he actually hires a hitman to kill him <laughs> to assassinate him so his daughter can get the uh, insurance money because if he commits suicide she doesn't get it so he's basically committing suicide by assassination so he figures well it's the final weekend of the campaign i'm gonna die anyways i might as well just speak my mind with no filter no not pandering for votes or whatever i'm just gonna say what i'm thinking with no political spin and that's what he does and uh, his popularity ends up taking off because people are so it's so refreshing to hear a politician not lying or spinning 
And then he doesn't want to commit suicide because everyone loves him suddenly. So he's like, oh, no, he's trying to escape the hitman. Uh, but that, that's the approach I take with the coaching business because so many people are full of it online and in the coaching world as well that it's refreshing when people actually speak their mind and, and there's yeah. none of that usual yeah. BS. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I just put up a, a post on Facebook this morning in one of my groups or on one of my pages that I was talking about, there's a, there's a commercial down here um, that's talking about, they're saying all these big words and you know, all this rigmarole and everything. And somebody says, hey, I want you just to explain to me in bumper sticker language mm. what you're talking about. And so I, I put up a post about that. Doesn't it make more sense to say what you mean, to say it in a way that people understand it? And, you know, rather than bringing in all of these people because it sounds like it's something they might want, only to later find out that it was BS. Yeah. Well, um, in language, I'm fascinated by in the business world, but God, it keeps going back to politics there. I keep saying, no, not to get this the last time. But um, I think a big reason, whether you love him or hate him, but a big reason why uh, Donald Trump won the Republican nomination and then the White House is that they did a, a, a study of the language that all the candidates were using, what grade level it was. Candidates like Ted Cruz, um, Hillary Clinton on the other side, uh, all these other ones, John Kasich, they were speaking at grade 11 level, 10, grade 12, like somewhere up around there. Trump was, at, I think, a grade three level um, the, with his language, the way he's speaking. But he hammered at home. He said the same things. Again, whether you agree with them or not, it was short slogans like build the wall, make America great again or whatever. Hillary had about 100 different focus groups to try to narrow down which slogan would win the most votes. And she couldn't answer the simple question, why do you want to be president? Why should you be president? And if you asked her, she would probably release a paper on it with, that was about 100,000 words to go through it instead of just a few simple words or a catchphrase with it. Same thing goes with business. You have to remember you're speaking to your marketplace. And it, that means you're not trying to impress them with um, words that are 50 letters long, but just speak to their concerns, their desires, their, uh, that you can show that you can solve their or help them solve their challenges and you'll have a lot better chance of getting the business. Yeah. That's why I like the phrase bumper sticker language, you know, it just, that's real clear in it. And, but I, I spent years in school. I've got a master's, a couple of master's degrees. I've got a doctorate. And so for a long time I was writing, but I was writing the 50 letter words and I was mm -hmm. writing, you know, uh, take three paragraphs to say what I could have said in one sentence, because that's the way you write when you're in school. It's taken me forever. That's why I hired a copywriter <laughs> because mm. it's taking me forever to figure out if you, if you work with people with chronic illnesses, say you work with people with chronic illnesses, you know? It, yeah. Well, there's something I uh, call a barbecue pitch. And what I mean by that is if I didn't know you and I met you at a backyard barbecue and I said, um, after we get done talking about the weather or the hot dogs or whatever, hey, Nancy, um, what do you do? Your barbecue pitch is your answer to that question. And it should be a very concise a one sentence answer that lets me know what you do and then invites further questions. What do a lot of coaches and online entrepreneurs do? If I would ask them that at a backyard barbecue, they'd look like deer caught in headlights or they would take five minutes yeah. with them. Um, you know, a speech that was like from Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you know, big long um, filibuster with it. Mm -hmm. So it's very clear when people say to me, Mark, what do you do? I help coaches get more clients without paid ads. You know, there it's you nothing go. fancy. It says what it is. Um, I know another coach, his whole thing is I help people make their first $10,000 online. So he's not saying I help people make money online. That's very broad, too broad. Mm -hmm. He's not saying I help people or for, he's not saying I help people make money. That's super broad. <laughs> he's not saying I help people make money online, which is still very broad, but I'm helping them make their first $10,000 online. So it's very clear that he's targeting a new internet marketer, not an experienced mm -hmm. one that's already doing well. Uh, right. with it. So I would encourage anyone listening, if you don't have your barbecue pitch nailed down, get it nailed down because it, it's vital. It's very important. 
how do you do that? I mean, uh, that it's that's another term for what most people call an elevator pitch. Yep. It's hard to do that because I don't think we ourselves can get around what it is we do. I think yeah. up here in our brains, we're confused and we want to bring in everybody. You say to somebody, you know, narrow down your niche and they go, oh, but that's turning away money mm -hmm. and that, you know, they can't get yeah. what they really need to do. So how does one create a clear and concise barbecue? Well, if someone listening is in that position right now where they're, they're beating their head against the wall, I would say, um, don't beat yourself up because you're not alone. I hear this from a lot of coaches, you know, when I'm talking to, so it's very common um, problem. I would say, take the pressure off yourself. Uh, remember that there's almost 8 billion people in the world. You only need a handful of them to have a very successful business. You don't need to appeal to everybody. In fact, you shouldn't. So I see this with a lot of life coaches and things that try to cast a really wide net. And then they end up working with no one or very few people and they aren't making much money from them because they're generalists. They aren't specialists. So I'm not saying that you have to get too crazy. The example that I always use is you wouldn't want to say, uh, I'm a, uh, I work with Dennis named left-handed Dennis named Bob from Boise, Idaho, who have recently gone through a divorce and are selling their business in the next six to 12 months. That's probably a little too broad. But what I would do if I were a health coach and someone asked me the question, what do I do? I wouldn't say, um, I help people lose weight or I help people get healthier. That's very broad. I would say something like I help uh, mothers and newborn babies get back to their pre-baby weight without spending all day in the gym. Love it. You know, it's, it's very clear who I'm targeting there. And there's plenty of mothers and newborn babies. That's not exactly a small pool to draw from. Mm -hmm. But I would have much more uh, luck going that route than if I just said, yeah, I'm a health coach. You know, yeah. nice to meet you. Yeah, absolutely. That um, makes and, so much sense. Yeah, and another tip which I'll share, which has helped clients of mine, is if you're not sure how to um, put into words what it is that you do and to nail down that barbecue pitch, uh, have a look at some of your testimonials from past clients, people you've helped. And there could be a certain phrase in there that keeps popping out. There could be breadcrumbs that you could follow. So if you've noticed that a few of them have said that Nancy helps me help me blank or Nancy was great at this, you might say, oh, that could work in there perfectly. And then you put it in. But usually speaking, your barbecue pitch is something along the lines of you help blank. Who is he help do blank? And it could even go further and say buy blank, <laughs> um, like I did with the health example. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense, makes it sound easy. I hope everybody listening wrote that down and so that they could figure it all out. Believe it or not, we are almost at the end of our time. I can't believe how fast this has hmm. gone. Time so, flies. Uh, you know, it's, it's great. What if there was one thing that we didn't talk about that you want to share, what would that be? Mm, boys, one thing. I mean, I could give a, a tired cliche, like don't give up, um, you know, keep plugging along, which, you know, I think is true. Um, I think for a, what I would share with anyone listening, whether you're a coach or an online entrepreneur, is you have to be really clear on who you're helping and how you help them. So we already talked about the barbecue pitch, but then you'll have to know how am I going to help them get the results. Uh, don't try to do 20 or 30 different things, have 30 offerings, and then uh, you can't focus on any of them. Uh, so even now I can fit my offers on a little yellow sticky note and that's why I want to keep it uh, with it as well. So don't feel like you have to be doing every single thing. I see a lot of coaches say, okay, I'm going to uh, write on day one. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to have one-on-one -on -one coaching. I have group coaching. I'm going to do events and retreats. I'm going to have a mastermind. I'm going to do this. I'm going to speak. I'm going to blah, blah, blah. And it's the same effect if you have 20 different people trying to get through a door at once. It's not going to happen. They're not going to get through that door. You're better off to start uh, very clear, build on it, keep putting the, the blocks on top of it, but start with just one or two things, get really good at that. And then you can add offers as time goes down the road. That's great. Speaking of offers, tell us something that you're doing right now that you would like to share with us. Uh, well, my big focus right now is my coaching jungle mastermind groups. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm, um, I have mastermind groups with eight people in each group and uh, we meet weekly. There's lots of stuff going on in between. It's for accountability, goal setting, uh, to help with uh, uh, feedback, brainstorming, and so on. 
And if anyone wants to check it out, it's at junglemastermind.com. Right. We will share that on the on the site so people will be able to, to find that. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate your being with us here today. Great information, great advice. And guys, if you want to hear this, you know, and other people who are also sharing their goals and their ideas, head over to www.don'twaittillpigsfly.com. Please share it with others, like us, follow us. If you have suggestions on topics for the future, let me know. We're always wanting to share the things that you want to know about. So until next time, everybody, get out there, be productive, and soar higher. Y'all take care, and we will talk again real soon. Bye-bye. Are you ready to get started in your business but don't know how to make the first step? Nancy would love to help you. As a disability advocate and a successful entrepreneur, Nancy can help your business to easily earn more, have control of your time, and take care of your physical health challenges. Just go to businesssuccessunlimited.com and use the contact form at the bottom of the page to schedule your call to see if you're a good fit. Nancy is ready to help you reach your goals.